All right, so welcome everybody to today's seminar, which is uh, going to be, be given by uh, Dries Vermeulen. I don't think that uh, Dries uh, needs uh, much introduction as he is a regular contributor to the field of uh, mathematical game theory. Dries is working at the Department of Quantitative Economics at uh, Maastricht University, so he's actually a colleague of mine. Now, maybe a few words about uh, Dries. Uh, going back in time, Dries uh, did his PhD on the topic stability in non-cooperative game theory um, and uh, with an emphasis on the Kohlberg-Mertens uh, stability. He wrote his PhD thesis at the University of Nijmegen in the Netherlands. And ever since, Dries has been working on and he is an expert in various topics in uh, game theory and related topics. If I may say so, Dries is a very versatile researcher. And just to name a few areas that he has been working on, I went through his uh, publications, even though I know quite many of them, just to name a few topics, stability and solution concepts in non-cooperative games, auctions, bargaining and cooperative games, social choice, uh, finitely additive uh, strategies and measures in non-cooperative games, and also various papers on uh, application areas. Uh, and uh, today's topic will uh, bring us back to one of the, the first topics that Ries has been investigating, I think, but we will see that it's the title is a new characterization of regular equilibrium. And this is a joint work with uh, Dieter Balkenborg from the University of Exeter. And Dries, we are very happy that uh, you were willing to give this seminar today. We are all looking forward to it. So as you know, you have uh, one hour and then you already said, so questions can come during the talk. And if there are questions, then after the one hour, there's time for questions and discussions as well. So Dries. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you, Janusz, for this uh, well, wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, so uh, the work that I'm going to present today is, uh, well, Janus already said that it's, um, you could say, uh, something that uh, is going back uh, to uh, to the type of research uh, with which I started on stability of Nash equilibrium. It's not related to Kohlberg mertens but it's even earlier than that, so the topic that we're doing today. And uh, in that sense, it's also, I think, um, well, so uh, together with uh, Dieter, and, uh, and uh, I think uh, hopefully an advertisement for uh, these uh, older results that are really worthwhile to, uh, to keep uh, in mind. So um, as you can see, the, the, and also like Janus already said, it's a joint work with uh, Dieter Balkenborg, who is also in the audience. Um, he is uh, by now um, retired, but uh, luckily for me, he's still uh, willing to, uh, to uh, uh, cooperate in doing research, which is, uh, and this is actually one of the, uh, the topics that we are currently and uh, most recently are working on. I think I looked it up. So at least what I remember is that uh, we uh, had our first conversations in the Bayreuth uh, SYNC conference. That was in 2018, so that is when we started to, uh, to work on this topic. And it says here in memory of Harsani, John Harsani, uh, because regular equilibrium was one of his um, well, contributions to game theory. And uh, like I said, one of the, uh, I think, one of the, well, you could say uh, one of the aims that we have with this paper is to... Um, uh, to re yeah, so to, you could say to revive an interest in, in, in this uh, type of research because I, we think that it is uh, worth doing that. Okay, so uh, let me go through the slides. Um, I don't know how long my talk will take. Um, Dieter uh, gave this presentation uh, on, at least on the same topic uh, last year in the Budapest uh, um, Game Theory Conference and he uh, um, well, I was on holiday, so I didn't see it, but he managed to tell everything in 20 minutes. Um, but I've got 50 slides, so usually that is an indication that I need at least one hour. So we'll, uh, we'll see how it, uh, how it goes. Um, but uh, please, uh, if you've got any questions, and I would rather have that you ask them during the talk than uh, afterwards, uh, especially if they're clarifying questions. I think it's better to do that uh, as we go along rather than uh, 
um, after the presentation. And I hope I can always shorten it a bit uh, my presentation. So uh, in that sense, I think I can keep it within one hour. Okay, so um, the introduction, uh, I'm going to uh, present uh, first the main result, which is actually very simple um, to, uh, to state. It says that if you have an equilibrium in a normal uh, form game, so a finitely many strategies uh, and uh, mixed equilibria, then such an equilibrium is regular in the sense of Harsani, which I will specify later, precisely when it is uh, what we call smooth, and uh, smooth means that um, locally, if you um, look at the equilibrium, the graph of the equilibrium correspondence, uh, so horizontally, you have to think of all the possible games. You, you fix the strategies that you have, and uh, you're varying uh, the payoffs that players can get. Then you get a, a space of games. And uh, vertically, uh, vertically, you plot um, the strategies of the players then, of course, you can plot the graph of the equilibria that uh, for each game you plot the equilibria, you get a graph. And that graph should locally be the um, graph of a differentiable function. So that is what it means to be smooth. And we're going to prove that that is exactly equivalent to being regular in the sense of Harsani. Please, may I briefly interrupt and yeah. ask a question? So sure. the way you state this here, this looks like an immediate consequence of the implicit function theorem. Yeah, we'll get back to that. So <laughs> can you one, one direction, yes. The other direction, no. Right. <laughs> so that is exactly uh, one of the part in the motivation is uh, that it's not a triviality. OK, so uh, uh -huh. OK, so but we'll get to that. <laughs> OK, thanks. But good, good that you ask. <laughs> So uh, Harsani regular means that, um, by the way, so it's also, uh, this for us is also very much a trial in that sense that uh, we also uh, find it uh, very difficult to, to judge, you know, how deep all this is because we rely also partly on, on old results. Um, some things were already known, some things were known by some people, but uh, not by uh, the, the, you know, the, um, the rest of the world. So it's, it's also difficult for us to judge exactly where our contribution, our main contribution, I think, is certainly that we try to at least, uh, you know, uh, give an overview of all this. And uh, so, um, and hopefully here and there we can contribute something ourselves. But I'll get to, I'll get to more specifically later on. So Harsani regular, um, that means that uh, the determinant of, uh, well, the Jacobian matrix as it was defined by Harsani, I'll give you a definition later, um, uh, is not uh, zero. So that means that in a normal, uh, so in a modern language, that the index is, uh, is not zero. Okay, so this is uh, the statement. And uh, yeah, we're uh, going to uh, um, explain what was already known in the past and also uh, where our contribution is. Um, and in connection to that, it is. Uh, on one hand, dedicated to Harsani, in memory of Harsani, but I think our paper is also very much what you could call a salute to the paper in 85 by Kojima, Okada, and Shindo. Um, because a lot of the techniques that we are going to use in our proofs are already in their paper. Um, you have to dig very deeply to find them, but they are there, uh, a lot of them. And we also uh, try to uh, uh, to make them uh, to simplify the proof that they have a little bit uh, because we have a very specific uh, context to which we apply it and sometimes you can do things faster than uh, what they did but uh, uh, our inspiration definitely comes from uh, this paper and it's also a large part of the research time that we spent was um, reading this paper and trying to understand it okay so uh, so that is uh, very much uh, what we try to do as well the paper is called Strongly Stable Equilibrium Points of N-Person Games in Non-Cooperative uh, and person Non-Cooperative Games in uh, Mathematics of Operations Research. But I'll come back to that as well. So the outline of the talk, um, I'm uh, going to give you, uh, well, the central literature, which is basically uh, three citations. Um, then, uh, so uh, this is uh, an answer to the, the first question, right? So we're going to explain why the results are not uh, trivial. So that's an answer. Maybe uh, the answer to uh, your question, Klaus, comes here. So uh, 
Um, then we'll switch to the, uh, the definitions. So I'm going to precisely specify all the notions uh, that we need in the paper. So regular, quasi-strict, smoothness, and strong stability. Um, then a bit more about the, the central question, which is basically what I already said. So that will not take much time. Um, and then our proof approach. But uh, before we get to the details of that, I want to do uh, an example that we think is uh, very, very uh, illuminating. Um, so we'll go through all the details uh, for this paper. And then we'll see uh, where we are uh, time-wise and uh, talk a bit about um, the, the details uh, of the proofs as far as time allows us. So that's the plan. Um, the literature, the first paper is, of course, uh, well, this is the start, I think, of, uh, of everything we do. The paper by uh, John Harsani in 73, oddness of the number of equilibrium points and your proof. So what he is doing is uh, proving that generically speaking, games only have what he called regular equilibria. Um, he also proved that these equilibri equilibria are quasi strict and uh, odd in number. So if you have a generic uh, a regular game, then it has an odd number of equilibria. And um, well, so uh, this is also uh, right the, the one direction of uh, what we are doing. Um, if you have a regular equilibrium, then it is not too difficult to see that is basically the implicit function theorem that uh, close to the um, equilibrium, the graph of the Nash equilibrium correspondence is indeed differentiable. Um, so that is one direction of uh, our statement. I'll give you the proof later on as well. Um, yeah, so uh, this is uh, what was uh, done in uh, that paper. By the way, maybe it's good to realize that um, checking, well, I'll talk about that later. So uh, let's first do the literature. And then there's this paper, Kojima, Okada, and Shindo, strongly stable equilibrium points of n person non cooperative games. And uh, like I said, I think this is uh, the paper of which we think that it did not receive as much attention um, as it uh, as it deserves. Um, so there's a lot, of, there are lots and lots of very useful techniques in the paper, um, and um, it's a bit of a pity because, uh, like Dieter said, the paper sometimes reads like. Um, it is uh, they uh, handed in uh, the wrong draft of the paper. So uh, there are here and there some typos and uh, sometimes even statements that are not entirely correct in the way they are phrased. But uh, if you think about it, you can recover uh, what is supposed to, uh, to uh, what it's supposed to say, and then it is correct. So um, and and quite interesting. Um, so in that sense, I think it's also uh, worthwhile to uh, to um, yeah, you could say. Uh, recover the paper and uh, present all the results in uh, in the correct form. So what do they do? Um, they have a few characterizations of a notion that is a bit weaker than regularity. It's called strong stability. I'll give you the definition also later on. Um, and that is their main uh, target to, uh, to do exactly that characterization. And uh, yeah. So, uh, well, so the regularity condition, by the way, is a, a system of um, uh, differential equations. And they prove that the strong stability is equivalent to uh, solving that system of uh, differential equations. And um, yeah, so it's basically a first order condition. And what they... Um, and so the, the strong stability is saying that locally the equilibrium correspondence is the graph of a continuous function and not necessarily differentiable. So basically what they're showing is that an equilibrium is strongly stable in that sense, if and only if it solves a certain system of um, uh, equations, uh, and so first order conditions. We do the same or something similar, but then for um, smoothness and uh, Harsani regularity rather than continuity and you could say Kojima regularity. Is everything clear so far? 
Will you give a difference? Uh, I mean, an example showing the difference between the two notions of regularity. Um, yes, I will come to that in the in the illustrative example. So uh, uh, we'll, I'll go into details in that as, uh, into that as well. But I would rather do it uh, with the example no, 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 at hand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then uh, the third uh, source of uh, information that we use is uh, the book by uh, Eric van Damme, "Stability and Perfection of Nash Equilibria." Um, book is very well written, so it's very uh, transparent uh, and very accessible. It's, um, source of information. Um, and why it is also interesting is because in Van Damme's book, he states that there is this observation in the Kojima paper that says that cross regularity, what we call cross regularity, that's not how they called it, but um, that notion plus quasi strictness is the same as Harsani regularity. Um, but in the Kojima paper, this is actually, um, it is a remark there, but it's only a remark. So there is no proof whatsoever of this uh, statement available anywhere in the literature so far. Um, it's not uh, a terribly difficult thing to do, but there is something to prove still. So uh, these kind of, you know, uh, details in the proofs we, we try to, uh, to fill. Um, so I think what we do is, uh, well, we talked about it at length with Dieter. Um, I think one thing that we do is to prove that every smooth ex uh, equilibrium is indeed quasi-strict. Um, I'll give you, uh, if time permits, uh, the proof later on. And uh, what we, I think uh, our main contribution is this. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, the Kojima paper for uh, dummies, uh, which means we mainly mean ourselves because we spend lots and lots of time uh, to actually figure it out. Um, and uh, so, uh, like I said, so uh, a lot of the time that we spent was uh, just that. So. Okay, so this is um, what we're going to do. The motivation. So this is the answer to uh, the question of uh, Klaus. Um, does the implicit function theorem have a converse, right? And uh, the answer is in some sense, no. So if you take this function here, y minus x to the power two, that is a uh, perfectly differentiable uh, function uh, from R2 to the real numbers. And um, well, the equation fxy is equal to zero uh, specifies um, a, uh, a function, right? Uh, whether you want to have x as a function of y or vice versa, uh, both are fine. Nevertheless, um, if you take um, the uh, derivative, so for x, you get, right? So you get the two times y minus x times minus one. So there's a minus two. And here you get a plus two. And what you can see that in any point where fxy equals zero, um, the derivative is zero, zero. So in that sense, the implicit function theorem does not tell you in this case that um, fxy is equal to zero defines a function. So y is not, a, not necessarily a function of x, and x is not necessarily a function of y, yet both are actually true. So it's not an immediate consequence, right? So the fact that something can be deduced using the implicit function theorem um, does not mean that the reverse should also hold necessarily. And in that sense, I think uh, there is something to prove. Uh, we prove an if and only if. One direction was already there, the other one is not. The same holds uh, for the Kojima paper. One direction is fairly straightforward. The other one takes a lot of work. Okay. Um, so we only have sufficiency here and not necessity. So uh, that is what we uh, need to prove. This is another one um, that is a bit less convincing, I think, whether if you have a continuous function, whether you always have a stable root. And of course, we all know the examples uh, where that is not the case. So it is true that uh, if you have a stable root, then uh, the function needs to go from a negative to plus or the other way around, of course. Um, but you can see that that is not a guarantee for having a stable equilibrium. Uh, but may I briefly interrupt again? Uh, yeah. Just stop me if that's too much. Uh, with small perturbations, uh, you can get it, right? Uh, so you can go from the left picture to the right with a very small perturbation, arbitrary small. 
Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you need something here also on the derivative, right? So you, you can make functions and then perturb it if you only care about continuity or so, of course, and you can also perturb, um, you know, the function I, y is equal to x in such a way that you get three equilibria close mm -hmm. by. Yeah. But uh, you need some uh, also some condition on the derivative of the function. But even then, these yeah, sure, but I mean, in a sense, you know, the, this is why perturbation theory was developed, right? Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the if and only if I think is quite special, right? So, uh... sure, yeah. But you know, in, in, in games, when you do these things, uh, you should always take into account perturbations, and uh, you know that's why the, the the natural thing to apply here is the index, really. Yeah, yeah, sure, we'll uh, we'll do that. But uh, but uh, but then still, uh, so like I said, so I uh, have the, the I think the the special. Uh, feature that we have is that we have an if and only if rather than just uh, sure. oh, yeah. one direction yeah okay so um this is the introduction uh, we'll now go to the uh, notation and to the definition so this take will take a bit of time but uh, there is nothing uh new to it so uh, we have a set of players finite and each uh, player has a finite set of uh, pure strategies. We denote them by I1, uh, I2, up to IKI. This is uh, just to uh, do justice to the Kojima paper. This is the notation that they used uh, there. So we, we decided to continue that also for our own sakes uh, so that we can uh, e more easily relate to our own um, uh, writings uh, to, uh, to that paper. Um, so these are pure strategies. The product of these sets is called S. And so we have payoff functions going from S to the real numbers, the one for each player, and the pair of S together with <coughs> the sequence of um, the vector of all payoff functions is called a game is strategic form. So nothing new here, I guess. Mixed strategies, uh, the notation is uh, like this. So a sigma i is a mixed strategy for player i, and it's a vector of uh, numbers uh, sigma i k, non-negative, and summing up to one. The notation for the strategy space, sigma i, and um, a vector of such mixed strategies, one for each player, is called a strategy profile denoted by sigma over here and the minus i's are what it usually means namely that you leave out player i from the profiles and of course you can extend the payoff function to uh, mixed strategies in the usual way so that was nothing new i guess that's just to uh, to determine uh, to to fix uh, the notation so far what we are going to do is uh, keep um, at least the number of strategies and the number of players fixed. And we're going to look at what happens when you um, are going to uh, change the utility functions, the payoff functions. And uh, so here's a bit more notation. The uh, carrier of a strategy are those pure strategies that receive strictly positive weight. So the sigma ik with that are larger than zero. The carrier of a profile is the product of the carriers of the individual strategies. And the uh, pure best responses or pure best replies are defined in the usual way. Those are the strategies that maximize the payoff function over all pure strategies. And this is a rotation for the product of all these best responses or best response sets. And then, of course, we have. Um, uh, sorry, I mean, if I may ask again, yeah. PI is the set of all pure best responses or all mixed best responses? Pure best responses. But then, obviously, you have the they are, all their convex combinations are also best responses, right? I mean, mixed. Uh, sure, but we we don't need that in the, in the notations later on. So okay, I don't think we have a, even in the paper. Uh, certainly not in my slides, but I think even in the paper we. We are not. Uh, we don't need notation for mixed uh, best responses. Mm -hmm. 
And the dot in i dot k is just instead of a subscript, you have this dot. Yeah, you can uh, put it in brackets or so, but then if you put it in a subscript, uh, that also doesn't read uh, very well. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks. It's like I said, it's a notation that Kojima uh, used in the paper. So we decided to, uh, to copy that. So an equilibrium is um, a, um, well, I'm not sure if this is a definition, but at least it's a result, right? So uh, that uh, an equilibrium is a strategy profile with the property that the carrier is a subset of the pure best responses. And uh, an equilibrium is called quasi-strict if these sets happen to be identical. So there are no best responses that do not receive strictly positive weight. And um, yeah, so there's, of course, the classical theorem of Nash that says that every strategic form game, as we defined it on you know, the previous slides, has at least one such equilibrium in mixed strategies. And what we're interested in is which ones actually survive if we are going to uh, perturb the utilities, right? So if you change the payoffs a little bit and then see what happens with the equilibrium. Okay, so um, that is the beginning. We're now going to, uh, so what the, the next few slides are about uh, Hassani regularity and uh, associated with that, uh, what we call cost regularity. So that is a regularity notion that was first studied in the Kojima, Okada, and Chindo. And they're both, the definitions are similar. So you take um, a strategy profile, sigma, and you look at one profile in its carrier. So you can take, without loss of generality, 1, 1, uh, 2, 1, 3, 1, up to n1. So you take the first strategy in the carrier. And what you're going to do is uh, to look at um, the following set of um, identities. So if sigma is an equilibrium, then it satisfies the following equations. So the fi1 of sigma is 1 minus the sum over all um, the uh, sigma ik. So you sum up all the weights um, from 1 to ki. And of course, because that is 1, um, sigma solves this equation, but it also solves these equations which says that um, you fix the I1, right? So uh, here in the second part is the payoff that the player gets against sigma minus I if he plays I1. And of course, uh, if it's an equilibrium, then for all the best responses other than 1-1, one, one, you should get exactly the same payoff. So the difference between these two payoffs should be zero. So every equilibrium satisfies these equations. Um, and you can group all these functions together in, uh, in a map. So, of course, here it was done coordinate by coordinate, but you can, you know, uh, put all of them together as a vector. And that vector is denoted by, uh, well, if it's the entire strategy space is called uh, F sigma, but we will also need it for um, sets in between the best responses and the carrier of, of that sigma and then uh, it's called FA. And A is then those strategies in the best responses that we focus on. So this function is not defined for strategies that are not best replies, right? Exactly. Okay, good. Of course, you could do that, but then, uh, then it need not be uh, a solution to that system FA is zero, right? So that's then the problem. Uh, it would be the solution to a system of inequalities. Yes, exactly. Okay, so um, that is that. Uh, we're also going to look at one map that is a little bit different from this one, uh, which is we take these uh, maps FIK and we multiply them with sigma IK. And this is actually what uh, people uh, who have seen this before will recognize as the map that Harsani originally studied, okay? Um, but the previous one is the one that is actually studied in Kojima. So that's why it's relevant for us. Okay, so uh, we have this map and then of course it's even true that um, sigma, if a sigma is an equilibrium, then it will, uh, 
if you plug it into this uh, function hik, it will give you zero regardless of whether ik is in the carrier or not, because either the probability is zero, and then this is going to be zero, or it's larger than zero, and then it's necessarily the best response. And then the difference between the utilities is zero. So for the Asani map, you really have that is uh, any equilibrium will automatically give zero for any IK, not just the ones in the carrier. That's the, the main difference here. Okay, um, and that is also, uh, you can see that also in the definitions. So uh, Hassani said that an equilibrium is regular and we call it the Hassani regular just for, uh, to make it uh, different from the regularity notion in Kojima at all. So if the Jacobian, deter uh, the determinant of this Jacobian dh sigma is non-zero. So the index should not be zero. And something similar for um, cost regularity. Uh, we say that an equilibrium is cost regular if all the Jacobian determinants of um, these reduced matrices, the FAs, um, is non-zero uh, for any A between the carrier and the best responses of that equilibrium and have the correct sign. Um, that sounds a bit vague, um, but basically it means that um, they need not have the same sign, um, but we know how the sign should change if you go from one A to the other one. So the, they may alternate in, uh, in, their, uh, in the index, but it should do that in a pre-specified way. So you can keep track of what, how it should change. So this is just a correction for the dimension? Yes. Ah, okay, thanks. So it's not a difficult thing to, uh, to keep track of, but uh, you need to keep it in mind, yes. Okay, so um, yeah. Um, and uh, now we are, go so these are actually notions that you can uh, compute uh, given a certain specific, a specific sigma, right? So you can write down these maps. And uh, so this is actually something you can test if you have the equilibrium itself. So it's a, you could say a local condition or a, a point condition. Um, the other notions that we're going to look at are local conditions where you really need to look at the graph of the equilibrium correspondence itself. So we're going to uh, model the space of games um, as a linear space, right? So you think of uh, the set of strategies as being fixed, the pure strategies, and you vary only the payoffs for each uh, pure strategy profile. And then for each uh, game, so that is a, a vector in some R uh, and uh, R n times S, you can uh, plot all the equilibria of that game. There's at least one, we know that. So you really get, uh, uh, really you get a graph. And uh, an equilibrium point is called strongly stable. If you have two neighborhoods, so one neighborhood of the game you're looking at and a neighborhood of uh, the strategy that you're looking at, in such a way that you could say, if you restrict the equilibrium graph to that box that you get that way, that locally it's going to really define um, the graph, uh, is going to define a continuous function. So there is a continuous function on the set of games such that the only equilibria um, that are in this uh, local uh, neighborhood um, are the ones that really, yeah, so for each game, you have exactly one uh, equilibrium and it's continuous. So that is strong stability and uh, smoothness, like I said, is just the same condition, but then not only requiring continuity, but differentiability. So that is- May I ask this, this, this yeah. distinction between uh, continuity and um, differentiability? In the context where you have all semi all semi algebraic sets, uh, everything is defined by polynomial inequalities. So, what what is the distinction really about? Um, you'll see that in a moment. So, uh, also in the example, we'll have uh, we'll have an uh, example of uh, both. So, an, an equilibrium that is strongly stable but not um, but not smooth. So, is that your question? Mm -hmm. It's more about the, the step from continuity to differentiability because with polynomials, that's not really a step. I mean, this is. Yeah, the, the, it should be uh, genetically the same, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Generically, 
yeah, yeah. generically everything is regular so uh one of the key points is probably that you had some corner of two or two. I mean, yes, exactly. And then, then it you'll see it in the example. So it's it's it's. Uh, I uh, first look at the graphs and and then uh, you can ask the questions. So uh, okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is the smoothness and uh, yeah. So the central question, like I said, so every uh, well, this is not a, not yet uh, the question. This is actually what is known, right? So this is the implicit function theorem. If you have a regular equilibrium. Um, then you look at uh, this uh, map that we defined um, and the uh, condition of Harsani regularity actually says that um, the derivative of this function is, uh, well, if you take it with respect to the, the strategies, is not zero. Um, and so that means that this matrix here has full rank if you fix the u and you vary the sigmas. And that means that the implicit function theorem applies in exactly the right direction. So you get that um, locally, you get a function, a differentiable function even um, from the space of games to strategies. So this is the easy direction. And the question is, um, does the converse hold, right? That's the question that we're looking at here. Sorry, if I may ask one more time, I mean, a sigma, so you vary not only you, you only vary the parameters of the function, not the sigmas. I mean, when you talk about smoothness. Um, in the smoothness, yes. So the smoothness is uh, the, uh, the the domain is the space of functions. Okay. And yeah, yeah. Uh, the strategy at uh, the graph of the equilibrium correspondence is a function uh, of the utilities. Exactly. So you don't vary sigma here in order to yeah. study this. Okay. Thank you. So the sigmas are the functions of the use. Um, and uh, so the ingredients that we need uh, to prove this is, um, well, so one thing that we know is that uh, if an equilibrium is Hassani regular, um, sorry, uh, what we know is that if it is cost regular and it is uh, quasi strict, then it is Hassani regular. This is something that is uh, known, uh, but it's also something that is uh, not proved anywhere. So um, uh, I think I saw it say that here. So the interesting uh, direction is um, to go from right to left, you could say. So if it's cost regular and quasi strict, then you want to prove Hassani regularity. Um, that is a remark in, Kojima, in the Kojima paper. Um, and it's also a remark in um, uh, Van Damme's book. But we decided to add a short proof in the paper. Um, yeah, so it's only a remark because this was not their main interest. They were only busy with proving that uh, cost regularity is identical to strong stability, and that is uh, their main uh, focus in that paper. Chris, can I ask a question on the previous yeah. slide? Um, so it's just below the theorem that hard sign irregular if and only if cost regular and quasi strict. So here, that I'm just trying to and to understand it in detail. So here, quasi-strictness, uh, the, the, the usage of this quasi-strictness is to restrict the, the domain of the set A, right? That you defined in the cost regularity. Or uh, yeah, exactly. A... So, uh, right. So that means that locally, um, all equilibria that are played with zero probability are actually not best responses. So they will also, yeah. in a neighborhood, not be best responses. So the only options that you have is to use the ones that you're already currently using. And because everything is played with positive probability, you also need to you need to use them also locally in the in the other equilibria, right? So the, the carrier doesn't change locally. Yeah. I understand. Thanks. Um, yeah. So and we have already seen that uh, regularity implies smoothness. Uh, that is the implicit function theorem. Um, so what we're going to do is this we're going to prove that smoothness implies quasi strictness and um, strong stability plus quasi strictness implies cost regularity. I think that is our main proof strategy. The first one is, uh, you could say, a short uh, proof. And the second one is, uh, well, on one hand, a short proof if you use Kojima. On the other hand, if you go into details and uh, you want to uh, prove it in this specific setting, you're busy for quite some time. And that's what we did. Okay, 
So we try to really uh, go into all the details and see how we can adjust it to our particular setting. So I'm confused about the last point. Isn't strongly stable the same as cross regular or do they anything? Yes, but uh, the proof is easier if you use quasi strictness, which in our case we can do. Okay, thank you. But you're right, yes. So uh, what they, what, what Kojima uh, and Okada and Shindo prove is that strong stability is identical to what we call cost regularity. What, well, our definition is also a little bit uh, different from what they have in the paper as in their main theorem. But if you go into the proof, you say that you can see that this is actually what they're using. So they're not, the, 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 diff, the, the system of differential equations that they have is identical to the definition that we have. Um, but also that is part of their proof. Okay, and they don't state it anywhere, so. That's why I said it's actually uh, also for us a bit difficult to exactly pin down uh, uh, what we uh, what is what is worth uh, reporting and what is not. So, uh, but maybe this example will uh, will help us. Um, so what we're going to do is the following: we're going to look at a three-player game, two by two by two. Um, player one is the role player, so we choose between A and uh, B. Uh, so we're here row A and here B. Player two chooses the columns A and uh, B, and player three chooses the matrix. So on the left-hand side, if he chooses A, and on the right-hand side, if he chooses B. And there is a parameter in there, which is the alpha. So if you change alpha, then you see the payoffs over here when player three chooses B uh, may vary. It's a one-dimensional uh, parameter space, right? So, uh, so you can re really think of this as a line in the space of games. And the game is denoted by this G of alpha. So the best responses for uh, player one, um, maybe I can uh, do that on my, uh, I'm sure if my Wacom will uh, allow me to do this. does not allow me to write anything, I think, at the moment. OK, so I cannot do that. Did you try to share a, a whiteboard? Yeah, that I can uh, do, I think. So Because uh, if you do that, that might be a possibility, I think. Yes. But I don't see where I can do that in this one. Can I do it like this? I think you can only by sacrificing the the uh, the current PDF. Sorry, yes, I'm afraid so. Either yeah. slides or whiteboard. Okay, that's unfortunate, but uh, yeah. So, but I cannot find a whiteboard. That's my problem. Please, can you annotate on your slides because that, that doesn't require the whiteboard. If you go to the top uh, with your mouse, you see view options. Do you see annotate? Yeah, but uh, usually there is the annotate, but I don't see that one here, and also don't okay. see a whiteboard in my uh, sharing uh, option. Okay. So that's my problem at the moment. I have got iPad. Either you share the screen or the whiteboard, but not, I mean, at the moment you're sharing the screen or an application, but it, it's when you start sharing where you see the whiteboard, not, not we would have to disconnect the sharing. Shall I stop, stop share and then see, so I can do that? No, it doesn't work. So I don't get a whiteboard, so I don't know uh, why it's uh, refusing that to do that, but maybe if I disconnect my welcome. These are my slides. I don't know uh, what went wrong. Usually I can do this, but at the moment I don't seem to be able to have a whiteboard. So my apologies for that. So uh, I can't find it. Anyway, maybe I can just explain. So uh, it's uh, not uh, too difficult to see. Um, so if player one chooses uh, A here, then you can see that on the left-hand side, he gets one, and on the right-hand side, he gets zero. 
So then the expected payoff would be uh, Z, uh, the, 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 the probability that player three chooses A, and something similarly chooses B. If player two chooses A, then he gets zero, and if he chooses B, he gets one. So you can see that the, uh, uh, the, the best responses depend on whether Z is larger or equal to one minus Q or vice versa. And if you do that, if you plot that, you get this. So you have to think of this uh, as player three choosing um, on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side. So we can, the best response is either on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side. And so uh, player, here are the A's, right? A, A, A. So that is where player one chooses uh, A over uh, here. And here it chooses B, right? So B, B, B. And uh, player two is choosing, what is he choosing? I think front or back, right? So player two has A, A, A over here and in the back B, B and B. So he chooses whether we are in the front or in the back. And the player three is choosing whether we are uh, on the ground floor or on the first floor, right? So that's how you can read this diagram. And we're talking about player one, so he chooses uh, left or right. And uh, if uh, Z is uh, larger than one minus Q, then he chooses left. And if Z is smaller than one minus Q, I think he chooses on the right-hand side. So you see, you get this kind of linear, uh, the line here. So this is the line Z is one minus Q, and that's where he switches from left to right. And in between, he's indifferent. You can do something similar for uh, player two. Um, it's almost uh, the same as um, for player one. Uh, in fact, originally, uh, this is a game uh, that was already used in the past uh, to have an, uh, an example of uh, an equilibrium that is completely mixed and therefore quasi-strict, um, but not Harsanyi regular. Uh, what we did was um, just asymmetrize this example a little bit, so to make it a bit more interesting. You'll see in a moment what that does. So this is the best responses for player two. You can see that it's almost the same. Huh? So if we would have um, not have the asymmetric version, then this would be the same, uh, look the same as uh, for player one. But uh, so now this line here doesn't end uh, in this corner point here, but a little bit above it. So that is where the asymmetry comes from. And uh, well, we're looking for equilibria. So you want to have the intersection of these um, uh, best response correspondences. And if you do that, you get something that looks like this. So you can see that if this point over here, right? I hope you see what I'm indicating. That is on the intersection of uh, exactly that line, right? So this one here, oh, oh, it's the wrong one. This one here and this one over here, right? And you can do that for all these uh, lines over that you see, these four lines, this one, that one, that one, and that one. And that's exactly the set of intersection points of these two graphs. The symmetric one would have this uh, internal diagonal ending exactly in BBA. But because we changed the numbers a little bit, it looks like this. Okay. And uh, just as a kind of uh, um, look ahead, uh, so for Klaus, so this equilibrium over here, the zero, one over six, five over six, is an equilibrium that's going to be uh, strongly stable, but not um, regular in the Harsanyi sense. So it will be, the graph will be continuous, but not differentiable, right? Um, I denote the, the strategies, by the way, by the first probability of each player, right? So P is a probability that player one chooses A, Q that player two chooses A, and Z that player three chooses A. Okay, so, uh, so far so good. Now that we add the third player. PR, sorry, I mean, why not PQR? I mean, I love curiosity. Um, yeah, so uh, that's a good uh, question, but... Uh, um, yeah, so uh, we already had, uh, I think, an R, so uh, yeah. uh, we had to come up with something else. Okay. But maybe we need to change that. So. Okay, and then, uh, so this is uh, the interesting part, I think. Um, what you see here is the best response correspondence of player three, and you can see that it is uh, um, given by a hyperbola. Um, and if the alpha is increasing, 
that means that B becomes a better a best response more often. So then this area here on top becomes larger. So that means that this uh, um, curve over here moves towards BBB and this curve over there moves to A, AB. Uh, and that means that these two, so there are three equilibria and there's the AAA here. And then these two um, completely mixed ones. If alpha increases, then these equilibria move apart. Okay. And you see that at some point, this equilibrium is going to be exactly at that point. And that is where we will have uh, strong stability, but not regularity. If you increase alpha further, it starts to move along this line and then it's again regular. It's also an interesting one because um, if you reduce the alpha, then these two equilibria move towards each other. Um, and at some point they will coincide. Um, that will not happen, by the way, uh, when these two, so it, it's a bit, so at some point, these two curves here will have uh, form a square, right? So that is when the hyperbola is uh, degenerate. Then these two equilibria are still apart. But what happens if you decrease the alpha further is that now the, uh, the hyperbolas will be on the other two quadrants, okay? And then there's only one branch uh, is going to make the two equilibria and when that one is tangent to that line, then the equilibrium disappears. And that is exactly a point um, that is not stable. Um, in, uh, it's not even strongly stable. And then this G alpha will be exactly the direction in which the equilibrium disappears. So you could say all possibilities are here in this one example. Okay. Am I making sense for everybody? So the equilibrium you can compute, it's over here. Um, so this is a nine divided by 20 plus or minus uh, this uh, square root over here. You can see the nine divided by 20 is exactly a bit less than a half. So that's why I said that comes from the asymmetry. So it's not exactly at the half, but it's a bit more asymmetric when the equilibrium vanishes uh, after we have uh, P is equal to a half. And uh, yeah, so the negative root converges to this equilibrium over here for alpha is five. So that is the strongly stable one that is not Arsani regular. If alpha is larger than five, then these are the equilibria and they're all Arsani stable. That's on the horizontal um, line. It's Arsani regular. And if alpha is exactly 119 divided by 121, that is when the square root is zero, both equilibria coincide, and then it is this equilibrium. So that is an equilibrium that is not Hassani stable. And you can see that actually there is a direction in which the equilibrium disappears. So it gets destroyed. The difficult part is always uh, to uh, find such a direction. So uh, if you have that uh, the equilibrium is not regular, then you need to find a direction in which the equilibrium gets destroyed. And that is always the difficult part. Is it clear that it should be a linear direction or couldn't it be some curve that is not even? Um, yeah, so, uh, so that is actually what uh, a, a large part of uh, the Kojima paper is about to, to find such a direction. And uh, you can, uh, what the, 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 the proof is really brilliant. So uh, it's, uh, it's really very clever construction. Um, so they, they use a certain type of, uh, you could say poly by matrix games where we all play bilateral games. And they use those kind of perturbations to find the direction in which the equilibrium uh, gets uh, destroyed. I don't think it gets destroyed. I think it's showing that you have one direction, the in, whereas you have index plus one, one you have index minus one, it's a center, it's it cannot right. Yeah. But, uh, but the, that is true in the proof uh, detail, but, uh, but then the, 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 the conclusion is that that cannot happen because it cannot change its sign, right? So uh, Yes, yes, but the contradiction it, uh, is not showing that there's no equilibrium nearby, it's showing that there's a contradiction with respect to index here. Sure. Yeah. But the consequence of that is that uh, there should be such a direction, right? In which it gets destroyed. Not sure. It's a bit, uh, 
so tomato, sorry, tomato, tomato I would say. Index but, uh, is zero of this equilibrium or what? So they prove two things. Well, maybe I should uh, go to uh, the slides further down. <laughs> so uh, they prove two things. On one hand, the, the, the index of the equilibrium cannot change. And on the other hand, there is a direction in which it changes. That's what they prove. And the conclusion then is that cannot be, okay? Um, so in, in that sense, they, uh, they do prove indirectly that there is a direction in which it gets destroyed. So they do not, um, yeah, I'm not sure whether the direction that they do construct has that feature, I would say yes. Because so it's it a cannot. zero, yeah. If that is yeah, a direction, exactly. yeah. So uh, no, but the, the equilibrium could have index zero. I mean, existing, and then if you move it, it decomposes into two equilibria. Exactly. The the proof is exactly about a zero uh, index equilibria. So okay. that's where the difficulty is. If the equilibrium itself is already plus or minus, then you don't have a problem. But the problem is with zero degree. Uh, sorry, the zero index. arises because it isn't zero at the origin. At the equilibrium, consider the index is not zero, because otherwise it could just jump from plus one to zero to minus one, but that's not happening. Right. Yeah, so they prove they cannot exist, yes. Right? Okay. So it's not about regular equilibrium, right? So we're, we're looking at equilibria that are uh, strongly uh, stable uh, so am I saying this correctly uh, now? I think I do. So the, the proof is about strongly stable and quasi-strict equilibria. You want to show that they are cost regular or regular if you wish. So that's what the proof is about. So you have strong stability plus quasi-strictness and that's what you, so it could still have potentially zero index, but you prove that that cannot happen. So that's the proof. And that's the difficult direction, right? So you start with an equilibrium that is strongly stable and quasi-strict, and you prove that the index cannot be zero. How do you do that? You assume that it is zero, and you derive a contradiction. OK, but uh, let me continue. Um, so uh, what, uh, what, uh, what basically what they do is, is um, well, so one thing that you can do is to look at these matrices and uh, transform them. What happens here is that you take, uh, instead of looking at the original payoffs, you look at the payoffs uh, uia minus uib, and then uh, b gives you always zero, okay? So there's a transformation of the game. And uh, of course, the equilibrium uh, set doesn't change. And also, very importantly, um, the uh, Harsani, so the, uh, so the, the, the determinant uh, of the Harsani uh, map doesn't change. So regular equilibria stay regular equilibria. And uh, for that transformation, you can uh, compute the payoffs if you play A, and that is in some sense all you need. So that is also already in the Kojima paper that you can do this kind of reduction of, uh, of the original map. Um, it's actually quite useful for us in this case because uh, originally you would have a six by six matrix if you write down the Hassani map, but uh, three by three suffices. So that's what we're doing here. So you get this map. And uh, if this one uh, has a, a non-zero uh, index, and so if, if the determinant of this matrix is non-zero, then you have uh, a Harsani regular equilibrium. So you can compute this determinant. It's like this, right? Because of the zeros on the diagonal, it's easy to compute. And uh, you see that uh, the equilibrium is, um, non-regular precisely when this part here is uh, non-zero. Alpha cannot be minus one because at already at the alpha is uh, 119 divided by 121. There are no equilibria anymore. So, so alpha is minus one. Yeah, sorry about uh, the transformation means this is something that leaves the best responses unchanged but sets one set of payoffs to zero. Is that what I understood? Yeah. Okay, good, fine, thanks. So, uh, and then uh, the next step is that then you only need to look at those um, payoffs uh, for A and you can leave out the payoffs for B. So for the regularity, that doesn't matter. So this is a transformation that, uh, that uh, Kojima also uses uh, at some point in their proof. It's the, one of the first steps they make to look at this matrix rather than the original one. Yeah, it's completely standard. I mean, it's here. Yeah. Yes.
Okay, so um, you can plug in uh, the numbers. Uh, so this was the equilibrium, and you see that if you plug in Q is 13 divided by 24, you get 13 divided by 2. And here, 9 divided by 2 is uh, right, so that is uh, exactly 22 divided by 2, and that is 11. So you get that this equilibrium has a zero determinant. So it's not Harsani uh, regular, and even it will not be strongly stable. So that is uh, what. Uh, because this is a quasi-strict equilibrium, that means there's only one A to test, and that is the A that is equal to uh, the carrier, which is what we just did. Okay, so the Kojima result uh, also immediately gives you that this equilibrium cannot be strongly stable. So, but if I understand the example correctly, I mean, you, you have these curves and then you move them together. I mean, then the, the uh, uh, hyperbola has become a cross, and then uh, the equilibria is still there. And at some point, these two equilibria merge. Yes. That can only mean that they have, at this point where they merge, they, uh, the one has plus one, and the other one has minus one index, and they merge and become an equilibrium of. Yeah, the yeah. I wish uh, I, I wish that I could uh, I could draw the graph because it's really uh, so you have um, this uh, oh, cross, right? Where the yeah. so not, currently here and here you have the hyperbola. Yes. And then at the half, um, this will actually be the, the uh, you the could say the, the right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then and then you take the other two. Yes. Um, but but because this this uh, diagonal uh, over here, so this big black diagonal, right? Yeah, yeah. So, it still crosses the intersects the two two now vertical parts. I mean, vertical exactly planes. this one. Yeah, yeah. So it is but a little bit. It's not exactly through this midpoint. Exactly. And, no, uh, that's fine. Exactly. But I mean, then I mean, but then the two equilibria merge to a single one, and then they disappear. Exactly. But the so, one that the merged one is actually of index zero. I mean, that's just just. I mean, it must be because it's. Yes, zero. that's what we just. Yes, exactly. That's what we just saw. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Good. Yeah. And uh, and that does mean that it's uh, uh, that it's uh, right. That is not Harsani regular, but it even means that it's not strongly stable. That's what I'm saying. So the second part is something that that you can get from Kojima, right? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So in some sense, what we're trying, what I'm trying to say here is that there are two ways uh, that something cannot be Harsani stable. Uh, either it is not, uh, not uh, sorry, Harsani regular. It's either not strongly stable, um, or it is strongly stable, but um, it is an equilibrium um, of this type here, right? Where simply the graph is not differentiable. So there are, you could say, two different ways in which an equilibrium can fail to be Harsani regular. Okay, um, I'm running out of time, I see. So, um, where am I now? So, um, yeah, so I also did the calculations for the other equilibrium. Um, so, this one is, I think, just standard. So, this is all slightly regular. Um, but this equilibrium here, that's the one on the corner. So, that one has a determinant that is, uh, that is non zero, right? So, you get minus 45 if you plug in uh, the values. So uh, that means that uh, you cannot deduce anything yet. Um, but you can also uh, compute. Yeah, so uh, you know that it's not Harsani regular because it's not quasi strict. Yeah? There, is an, there is a best response that is played with zero probability because it's a limit of the completely mixed ones. Um, but it might be strongly stable, and it actually is. And you can check that by looking at the part of the graph that. Um, where P is equal to zero and uh, look at the uh, other matrix, which is this one. And that one has a positive sign, which is exactly what should happen, right? So the sign should flip and you see that happening in this example. So that means that this one is strongly stable. Okay. While both determinants are uh, non-zero, right? That can happen. Okay, um, yeah, I am uh, over my time. So what should we uh, do? Maybe I'm looking now at the organizers. So uh, basically what I'm going to do in the remainder is uh, talk about uh, the implication from smooth to quasi-strict and the implication from um, strongly stable and quasi-strict to cost regular. Um, should I do one of the two or should I stop? What is your advice? It also depends how long they are. 
Uh, the first one is, I think, uh, uh, three minutes. So that's okay. not long. The other okay. one takes a bit more time. So this okay. one is actually sure, quite sure, uh, straightforward. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. okay. <laughs> so um, the quasi strict is actually quite simple. So uh, you start with a smooth equilibrium. Our original proof was longer, but uh, we shortened it until it's really almost uh, uh, straightforward. So um, you start with a smooth equilibrium that is not quasi strict. Um, then you look at the best reply that is not in the support of uh, of uh, sigma, right? There should be one, so we call it uh, I K I. And you're going to look at the following family of uh, games. So you keep basically everything the same, except the payoff for the I K I to which you add T. So basically, it means that everything stays the same unless player I plays K I. In that case, he gets his original payoff plus an extra bonus of the euros, right? That's how you can read this. And uh, well, if uh, the equilibrium is uh, smooth, that means that um, the composite map, so you take this, the equilibrium sigma it uh, and you compose it with uit, so that this is a differentiable function, right? You can, for every t, you can do this. And if uh, the graph is uh, smooth, then this is a continuous, or, uh, even a, sorry, a differentiable function. So you can take the derivatives. That's what we're going to do. And we observe that if t is negative uh, or, zero, uh, or zero, then uh, the equilibrium doesn't change because we had an equilibrium. So we only put weight on uh, best responses. And the only thing that happens now is that one of the ones that you're not using um, gives you less payoff. So that's not going to be a best response. So at least in that direction, nothing changes, which means that in the derivatives uh, of uh, this composite function, you only need to look at the derivative of uh, UIT itself, which is zero for um, um, all strategies that is not IKI, and it is one for the ones where it is. And that means that um, for T larger than zero, at least for small T larger than zero, Actually, IK, uh, KI is going to be a strictly better response than the ones that you're using in the equilibrium, right? Because um, this one increases linear in T and the other ones have, uh, well, are at best quadratic in their increase in, uh, in utility. So at some point uh, for small T, um, IKI is the only best response and you're not playing it. So that is, uh, at least uh, you play also the ones that are not longer best response. Maybe that's, uh, you could put way positive weight on the, on the new best response, but because of the continuity, uh, you should also still put positive weights on the ones that are no longer best response and that can't happen, right? So that's the proof. Then uh, this proof, which is um, in some sense, um, an adjustment of uh, the proof that is in, um, uh, in some sense already in the Kojima. So we're relying heavily on the techniques that they're using there. And uh, yeah, so it has several steps. Um, because of the quasi strictness, you can assume that uh, the equilibrium is completely mixed because like Jan has already said earlier, um, locally, these are the only uh, strategies that, uh, that matter, right? The ones that you're using in the, uh, that you put, that you're playing with positive weight. We can assume, like in the trick we did before, yeah, so this uh, standard trick uh, that um, all the utilities of the last strategy are zero. And that means that you can simplify the Kojima uh, maps even further. So this is the one that you're actually looking at in the proof. And uh, yeah, so here it is, right? So now you assume, uh, so the assumption is that you have a strongly stable equilibrium that is quasi strict and you assume that its index is zero, and then you derive a contradiction. Step one is showing that locally, um, this map GV is a homeomorphism. That is uh, something that is uh, already in uh, Kojima. So we copy their proof. And here you use a strong stability of the equilibrium. In step two, we are proving that um, you can, that locally, um, if the index um, is non-zero, 
that is always the same sign, okay? So it can be positive when it's positive or non, eh? so uh, then it's non-negative everywhere or it is negative and then it's non-positive everywhere, uh, either zero or negative. That's formulated here. And uh, this is still, you could say, a general proof. Um, eh? So uh, of course you need to go through the steps but it is something that is not relying on the specific context that we are in. It uses such theorem and the homotopy uh, theorem and the uh, step one that we, uh, we talked about earlier. So in that sense, this part is still general, uh, but the last part, so that is what Dieter said. So the last part is showing that there is um, a direction in which you can move, right? And if you move in one, if you start in the equilibrium, you move in the positive uh, direction, then, the, then the, the, the index is plus, and in the other direction, it's minus. And that's, of course, a contradiction with what we concluded in step two. And in this part of the proof, this is where you really use the setting. And so the fact that we are looking at equilibria of finite strategic form games. And that is very specific. And also the construction is very, very specific and very clever. So. Do you agree, Dieter? Or... I think this is basically what it is, right? Yeah, I think uh, this is uh, more or less where I uh, should uh, stop. Um, I think this is also the end of my slides. So uh, are there any remaining questions? Yes, but I think we should first thank you. I mean, yes, I don't know that's what I, I wanted to jump in, Dries. That first, uh, we should thank you for the very interesting talk. And then, as you can see, it inspired the uh, discussions and questions quite a bit today. So let, let's thank Dries first of all for the, uh, the interesting talk. And, and uh, then, indeed, uh, if there are questions, then this is the time. Bernard, I saw you. Uh, you think, I mean, yeah. So I'm. Um, so my question is um, in computation of equilibria, um, there is a notion of non-degeneracy. So my question is, um, is there a good definition of non-degeneracy? Because every specific game that you have is not generic. Uh, typically your examples have small integers, whatever. I mean, uh, and I mean, in particular, when you want to compute something, you want to have a good definition to say, this is this specific game. It's mm -hmm. not generic, but it's not degenerate. So in two player games, there's a very good definition which says every mixed strategy has never more best responses than the size of its support. So if you mix three strategies, you never have four best responses. That doesn't work in, um, or maybe it does work, but I don't think this is a good definition. It, this implies automatically quasi strictness of any equilibrium. But um, <clears throat> in three player games, you can easily have a re completely regular equilibrium where somebody plays a pure strategy and the other two people mix two strategies, for example. So, I mean, they clearly don't have equal supports in their, in their equal. Yeah, that's actually the example that we already had, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah, for, think, for example, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and, and even, but so what is a good definition? And it should be done yeah. not in terms of the equilibria, but in terms of the best response correspondences. What is but I think, uh, yeah, I think, I, I think I understand, if I understand the question correctly, uh, Bernard, then I think the answer would, for my answer would be that it really depends on what you want to compute. I think that, so you see the level of generosity that you need may vary uh, depending on, on whether you look at, you know, Harsani regular or cost regularity or, right? Yeah, so, but uh, I mean, so I assume, you know, no, what I'm assuming is, I mean, you can have, I mean, you can probably write down a polynomial that must, must not be zero. And that's your definition of, um, mm -hmm, uh, yes. um, 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 uh, then, uh, but it might be way too strong. Um, mm -hmm. So for instance, if you look at the identity matrix for two players, two player games, I mean, that is highly non-degenerate because of all these, uh, how, how highly, I mean, non-generic because of all the zeros in there, but it, all the equilibria are perfectly regular in there. Mm -hmm. So um, what would be good is a good definition of non-degeneracy in-, in Yeah, in I think our result shows that uh, the, the original notion of Harsani was not that bad after all, right? So- uh, perhaps, perhaps, yeah, okay. Uh, so because the, you, you might think no, that the there are... Is, I mean, no, no, here's the problem. The problem is that this applies to the equilibria. 
And once you have the equilibrium, I don't need to worry about uh, <laughs> this anymore. Yeah. So uh, I mean, okay, so I, I want see. to have something that starts before, for instance, the lemke hausen algorithm. Um, yes, uh, I see what you're saying. Might, yeah. might not. So uh, that, but only that. Uh, as I say, the definition um, in two-player games uh, is completely undisputed and very easy. But I don't have an, a good one for more than two players. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, yes. I wondered whether. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, a projection problem, right? So some extent, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for instance, your diagonal, the first best response correspondent of player one in your example was clearly bad because it had this diagonal going through. I mean, that was uh, something that looked, I mean, uh, as a possible example for uh, non, for degeneracy. Yeah. I mean, something that goes through a corner um, and hyperbola that goes right. through a corner is not a good idea. Anyhow, thank you. Sure. I'm still struggling with that definition. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, uh... Yeah, like I said, I think it's a uh, in, in more player in uh, player game. So with uh, three or more player games, this might actually be a difficult thing because it it it, it, it so the, the 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 condition is on the equilibrium indeed. So in the in the in the product space, and basically what you're asking is for which games do we have uh, problems uh, up here, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, in that sense, it's uh, yeah projecting uh, semi-algebraic sets, and that in general might be a difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe a question from me to the uh, to the audience is, uh, what do you think of this? So, uh, like I said, so we were busy with it a lot, and uh, I think our uh, own uh, interpretation of uh, you know uh, our contribution was varying from uh, well, it's actually quite a lot to um, should we publish this? Am I saying this correctly, Dieter? Or uh... yeah, I think our contribution was always small, but uh, yeah, so. we always felt both a problem that actually the paper by Kojima and Chindo and uh, Okada isn't uh, quite always quite correct and therefore very, very difficult to read. Yes. Uh, so getting through there was, I think, a contribution, yeah. hopefully. Um, and for me, it's still, um, I understood Klaus' uh, comment in the beginning, well, that's all trivial, but that assumes that hazard, that uh, implicit function theorem would be an if and only if condition, which it isn't. So, and if you look into it, there's a lot of explicit construction and usage of index here in quite a clever way. So yes. if I can convince people that this is not trivial, I think then I would have achieved something. <laughs> okay. Just to correct Dieter, uh, I didn't want to imply that this is trivial. I was just asking, which which uh, aspect do you want to emphasize here and what you're going mm -hmm. after At the uh, so since you Dries asked you know what, what is this paper or where should you publish this paper uh, it's a theory paper in the end that deals with um, relatively subtle differences between solution concepts yes. that matter for non-generic games um, th this is interesting to a certain extent, but on the other hand, I also think that in the end, what you, sh what you should care is about generic games. However, I do not think that the notion of generic normal form games is a good notion. Right? You should actually look at generic extensive form games, and that's a linear subspace. Therefore, itself in normal form space, non-generic. Right? Uh, because in the end, you know, what do we use a game for? We use a game to explain certain phenomena that we see in the data or in the real world or in lab experiments or whatever. And these phenomena we cannot see if they are not stable, statistically speaking, right? If they, if they vary with very, very small changes of the environment, we wouldn't see them, right? So these things have to be in a sense robust. Oh, yeah, but from a stability point of view, uh, even strong stability is still, uh, it's one of the stronger notions of stability that we actually have, right? So, uh... yeah, yeah, no, but what I'm talking about is, is how to perturb the games properly, right? Mm -hmm. so I think, uh, the, the normal form space is a bit too big in a sense, right? Yes. Too high dimensional. The right perturbations would be extensive form space. So, fix a tree or the extensive form with its uh, information sets and so on, and vary the payoffs uh, to the place. Right. Mm -hmm. That would be an interesting uh, space to look at. And if we have results on that space for generic games in this space, I think these results are really useful, right? In normal form space, I'm not so sure. Mm, I think it's always a special case. 
normal form games you can always think of as a special case of extensive form games. Uh, yes, that but when you look really at Selton's really horse, I mean, yeah, that's a too much of a too very trivial extensive form games because uh, basically players choose at the root all the strategies, right? <laughs> but we ignore all these payoff ties that come in from non trivial extensive forms. You say Bernard? So, um, uh, Zelten's Horse, for example, is, an, is a game which is, has only two actions per player and it already has lots of degeneracies. I mean, and so maybe it's worth looking at some variations of that if we want to pick up Klausen's suggestion. Maybe you can f um, have a game of that sort. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I've written, I mean, I'm writing a program now that solves these two by two by two games uh, graphically and produces exactly these cubes and so on. Okay. Um, because even certain source, you have no no program that outputs all the equilibrium of certain source. It's amazing. I mean, so we, we at least we have solved that problem. The two by two by two, uh, three player game, which doesn't sound great, but it's actually quite useful. So you might, might okay. I'll, I'll keep you. Yeah. What uh, what what uh, what's the language in the? No, no. It's I mean we we it's yeah we. Um, oh, it's a tool. Okay. Good. No, we we, we produce. I mean, for instance, XFIG files that display these uh, cubes and so on. So I mean, um, it, it's yeah. Can it handle parameterized uh, games or? <laughs> no, we, not yet. Okay. We probably make, yeah, yeah. Uh, why not? I mean, uh, uh, let me try to add that to the to the as a feature. Yeah, I took lots of screenshots here now. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other? Remarks or questions? I have one. Okay. Yeah. J just a quick one that whenever someone does research in a topic, there are always new questions arising. So what would you think that, uh, uh, what would be a challenging next step or what? Uh, what? Ooh. It's a, okay, then it, the forget the <laughs> In this context, uh, I don't know, do you know anything, Dita, that springs to mind? Uh, yeah, so the question that we, we Klaus just... had a perfectly yes. good example. If you think, as I suggested, that uh, normal form games can be considered as very specific extensive form games, we have a definition of regularity in these games, and how do these results now, can they be meaningfully extended to more general classes of extensive form games? And you have an interesting one. Okay. Yeah, the other direction I think would be uh, computational aspects, uh, right? So uh, yeah. I think so. I wanted to ask something about that, but Bernard asked it much more uh, precisely and much better. So that's. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. No more questions. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It was uh, very good to uh, give a presentation. Thanks for being for listening and uh, yeah. Hopefully we can go back to uh, also seeing each other in real life again at some point. Slowly, I think so. Yes. Yes. It is. Uh...